How to Save Your Marriage, a homily by Father Pyotr Pavlukevich, translated into English, and based on the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 to 33. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. After they were departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in sleep to Joseph, saying, Arise, and take the child and his mother, and fly into Egypt, and be there until I shall tell thee. For it will come to pass that Herod will seek the child to destroy him. Who arose, and took the child and his mother by night, and retired into Egypt. And he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which the Lord spoke by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, perceiving that he was deluded by the wise men, was exceeding angry, and sending, killed all the men children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the borders thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice in Ramah was heard, lamentation and great mourning, Rachel bewailing her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. But when Herod was dead, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in sleep to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For they are dead that sought the life of the child. Who arose, and took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But hearing that Archelaus reigned in Judea, in the room of Herod his father, he was afraid to go thither, and being warned in sleep, retired into the quarters of Galilee, and coming, he dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was said by the prophets, that he shall be called a Nazarene. My dear friends, it is very surprising, or even... Um, very difficult that when, it, that when it comes to the Holy Family, uh, we're talking about a family, uh, a marriage. And when we think about marriage, we, we wish it to be uh, of one accord, that there will be peace, uh, that there will be kindness towards each other. And then the ideal idea of marriage is that the spouses will love each other and that they will um, have children and raise those children and have a comfortable life. They will be together. But here, on the other hand, we read about a family who didn't have that calm life or that peacefulness uh, indeed they had uh, peace and love in their hearts they loved each other and trusted each other but the Bible doesn't tell us not even once that St. Joseph and Mary uh, had a, a special time together where and maybe they sat by the fireplace and just talked um, over a cup of tea. There's no mention of Joseph and Mary um, talking to each other about uh, how, how their days were and uh, Jesus playing with the cat or with some toys uh, in the other room. The writings of the Holy Family in the Bible um, are like from a like a sensational film, uh, almost like something that's almost hard to believe. Before uh, they they were married, uh, with the the visit of the angel to Mary, and then uh, during the birth of Jesus in the stable, and the visits of the wise men, and um, the flight into Egypt, none of it was a calm or peaceful marriage or, or existence.
wszystko to jest... Oczywiście, proszę Państwa, oni byli małżeństwem wiele lat, nikt nie ustali ile, bo nie wiemy kiedyś. Of course, uh, they were a marriage of many years. Uh, no one knows exactly how many years because the Bible doesn't say. But um, we know that uh, uh, Saint Joseph died, uh, that Mary was alone uh, at the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, but of course, they must have done things as a family. They must have gone to weddings and to celebrations. It's uh, quite certain that they must have had many happy times as a family and many uh, times for laughter. But the Bible, but the Bible tells us about the difficult times for the Holy Family, and this must be an important sign. This must be a sign for us. Because in all of their problems there is something common. Before the marriage, St. Joseph was obviously concerned that perhaps uh, Mary had not been faithful to him, that uh, she was pregnant, that perhaps this uh, this was something uh, not good. Adultery, what kind of child is this? If, if Joseph had decided to um, accuse her formally of adultery, uh, she would have been stoned, and along with her, the baby Jesus inside her. So in this first challenge, it's about um, it's about Jesus. That Jesus is is the reason for this kind of um, uh, hard and difficult moment between Joseph and Mary. The, in this moment, Jesus as a as a baby in the womb. Then, during the birth of Jesus, uh, we see Joseph and Mary trying to find a, a safe place for the baby to be born, right? Uh, looking around uh, Bethlehem and ending up in a stable where Jesus is the center. Um, again, Jesus is the theme of that challenge. And, and the flight into Egypt, again, being to protect the baby Jesus. And so the commonality of these uh, three different um, descriptions of the Holy Family early on in the Gospel is to protect Jesus. To protect Jesus. And my uh, dear brothers and sisters, we can say today that every marriage in the world is meant to protect Jesus. It's very dangerous to have a stereotype of marriage um, as a Christian that um, that the that the non-believers hold this ty type of stereotype um, is one thing, but for Christians to hold the stereotype is very dangerous. And the uh, the problem is that we, as married Christians, are really looking to the marriage as a as an island of peace, as a as a place where we can relax and, and feel comfortable. A woman uh, looks at the various candidates for a husband and says to herself, hmm, uh, am I going to be uh, happy with this man? Uh, is he going to provide a comfortable life for me? 
Is he going to take care of me? Is he going to be able to fix the house is, and do the renovations? And then the man looks at the candidate for a wife and he says, uh, is it going to be good for me to be with this woman uh, in the days and, and maybe at the night time? Uh, is she going to satisfy my needs, uh, all my needs? Is she the right person for me? She's very hard working. She's very pretty. She's got nice long legs. Is she the right person for me? And the whole prince, the whole, the whole principle of this type of discussion in one's mind is: Is the home going to be a stable and a comfortable place? But in fact, the family, the purpose of the family is to um, get through uh, the polygon that we call life, is to help each other move and maneuver in the very complicated polygon of life. which this polygon can be described as the world. And one can look at the world as a school where we learn how to love. It's one way to look at the world, as a school where we learn how to love. And this school is complicated. It has many levels and is difficult to maneuver. And so one can think of the family as a group who is trying to climb to the peak, uh, using the example of a mountain, as a group that together is trying to reach the peak. And my dear brothers and sisters, when people are deciding about getting married, uh, the first question that they really should ask is, are the two of us, are we together, going to be able to make it to this peak? Are we going to reach it? The, the, the female should say, when I get to be very emotional, when I get to be very emotional, when I feel like I'm uh, the the dumbest person, or um, well, when, when my emotions take control of me, and when I look around and I see all my neighbors have better better lives, they have better cars and better clothes and fancy uh, perfumes. She should. She should say to the husband, will you, or the candidate for the husband, will you be able to pull me out of that? Will you be able to pull me out of that when I start to kind of drift and become uh, stressed and confused uh, and emotional? And hey, how about you, uh, candidate for a wife, when something... Uh, kind of goes crazy in my head and I start to flirt with other women or maybe I take uh, my co-worker, my female co-worker out for coffee um, or I start to drink some alcohol and it becomes a regular a regular behavior um, listen listen my wife will you pull me out of this? will you Hold me or throw me the life preserver when I start to drown? Will you help me out of this mess? Will we be able to make it to this peak? That's really the question that two people should ask each other before they get married. But, but look at how the conversations really are in most of the marriages. For example, 
If you drink that much one more time and embarrass me one more time, we're through. Or, alternatively, uh, drink as much as you want. Just drink until you can't drink anymore. And just, uh, you know, just just ruin your life. It, it's, it's your life. Do with it what you want to do. The other extreme. So people are not really preparing for the marriage to be a journey or a traveling through the polygon to reach the peak of the mountain. But rather, they're thinking to themselves, how can I be very comfortable? And uh, will this be something that will make my life easier? They think to themselves, is this person going to disappoint me or hurt me? Of course this person is going to hurt you or disappoint you. Of course. So, as a priest, when I work with engaged couples, I ask them these questions. Do you talk about these things with each other? Do you say to each other, when I start to disappoint you, when I start to let you down, will you be able to do it? Will you be able to handle it? And then the the candidate for the the husband, the the uh, fiance, he says, "Of course, if you start to go off kilter, I'll even bring uh, I'll go so far as to bring the pope to our house to to help straighten you out." Uh, what he says when he's engaged. And then she will joke and say, "Oh, don't, uh, don't be so uh, uh, funny. Uh, it doesn't have to be the Pope. It could be a cardinal." Ha ha ha. But I will, f I will f organize everything for you. I will start to drive around and find uh, people to help. And you know, in fact, I know these kinds of couples who are married. Where the wife started to kind of act strangely and do, um, start to act strangely and start to um, do things to hurt her husband. He, he didn't just uh, break down. He, he started to um, find out what was going on. He reached out to her, he followed her and asked her what was wrong, he didn't just let her walk away. But not in a weird, creepy way, but in a, in a loving way. I've seen many examples where husbands will fight for their wives, and uh, the other way around, where wives will fight for their husbands. I've seen these types of examples. I've seen wives who say, yes, my husband is completely lost. He's lost in alcohol or he's lost in pornography. And I've seen them spring into action. I recently read a, an article from a school for leadership, uh, particularly military leadership. For, for young men who are going to pursue the military career, uh, very strong, very muscular men. And in this article, the, uh, the military leader says, Now I'm going to tell you the most important thing, the most important thing you need to know, young men. And the young men were getting excited. They were thinking about um, tactical skills or some kind of strategies. And what this leader said is, look around this room. 
there are many young men in this room. And your job is to find one of these men to be your confidant and friend before this course, this leadership course is over. All of you have to have a friend so that when you go into battle, you have a friend that will help you. So today, get to know each other. So that by the end of this training, you will have at least one friend who has your back when it's time to go out. So the commander who wrote this article when he was a he, recalling uh, back to the time when he was a young uh, enlisted man in the army, uh, he, he was shocked. He didn't think that that would be the first thing that they would teach him, that he needed to have a friend who would, who would have his back. And so now, as we apply this to married couples, and we look at our spouse. This is that friend, the other commander, who's going to help pull you out of that ditch or out of that line of enemy fire. When something bad starts to happen, uh, don't think that life is just going to be a piece of cake. Right? Life... Life is, is trying to survive uh, many, many difficult and dark times. It's not so easy. It may seem easy now, prior to the marriage, but life will throw you curveballs and difficult challenges. And so, my brothers and sisters, I see how God tries to correct the thinking of, uh, of the people who are going to become married. Not that marriage will be uh, uh, an island of, of peace and comfort or a dollhouse for Barbie dolls. I've seen many, many marriages, and maybe uh, recently I've met actually quite a lot of these. And the dreams and wishes that they had going into marriage very quickly dissipate. And even as soon as several months after the marriage they come to my office and they tell me that it's time to get a divorce, that uh, this person who they loved just months before and pledged to be with is no longer uh, the person they want to be with. And and I say to them, persevere. You see, it's actually good that you have this difficulty now, very early in your marriage, because you needed to learn that marriage is not a cakewalk. So I tell them to persevere, that this is actually a good thing that's happening, because it, in the end, if they persevere, it will make them stronger. It is true, it is absolutely true, that... Um, an important element in a successful marriage is, is based on expectations. If the expectations are unrealistic, then the marriage will be difficult. Many times, uh, the wife is just so angry, and not even so much that she's angry at the husband, as she is at herself for being so naive, for thinking that he was something else, for having a different impression of who this person was. 
I thought we were going to sit around the table and drink cappuccinos and he would hold my hand and kiss me and that our life would be so easy. And he is not who I thought he was. I was so dumb. But she'll never say that. She'll never say that out loud. And she'll never say that, obviously, to him. My dear brothers and sisters, it's good in the beginning of the marriage to get something like this. To get a wake-up call. I remember when I went to school, to high school in Warsaw, I was put in this uh, class A, like this honors class. And, you know, we all realized that we were very good students and we thought of ourselves as the best students in the school. We were leaders in elementary school. We were on different uh, academic clubs and uh, um, had much success in elementary school. My first class was uh, Polish language. And the teacher comes in and she tells us to pull out our notebooks and she's going to do dictation. And so we're just all smiling to each other. This is like, in our mind, the easiest thing ever. What is this? This is no problem. And when it was over, uh, we all got uh, bad grades. No one got a good grade. I actually did a little bit better than the others, but it still wasn't that good. And so we went to our homeroom teacher, because the, the Polish teacher wasn't our homeroom teacher, and we were all very sad. And our homeroom teacher asked us, what's wrong? Uh, why are you so sad? What has happened to your, to your good humor? And we told her that we had dictation with the Polish teacher. And then our home teacher said, oh, you guys fell for it. She does that every year at the first lecture. And so there it was, my first day of high school, and I got a bad grade. And I was scared to even go home and tell my parents because uh, it was such a shock to me, and I didn't want to admit it to anybody. The only thing that really helped me feel better was that everybody did poorly. So I thought to myself, well, hmm, at least everybody else did poorly too. And you see, some marriages, they get a bad grade after three months. You don't always have to be the best, and you don't always have to be the leader. Many people who are engaged and seemingly have a wonderful engagement uh, who would be leaders and should have great marriages end up not having uh, those great marriages. So, specialists during engagement don't always turn into specialists during marriage. I'm going to try to paint this picture a little bit for you and please, uh, in all truth, try to think that marriage is a complicated polygon. And you're going to have to um, sometimes run, sometimes walk, sometimes try to avoid being hit by the hailstones. And sometimes you're going to have to throw a line to your partner and help pull them forward to where you are. How much of this depends on expectations? So much. I don't want people to think that family life 
is some kind of horror film, but one could best call it a thriller. Jak się na to nastawisz? Proszę, nie czekajcie na, 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 na mnie. You have to be ready for this. Don't wait for a perfect marriage or for uh, you know a, a, a movie, a storybook marriage. Pamiętam, kiedyś byłem na Górze Świętej Anny i były powołaniowe plakaty do zakonów. I remember once I was in the attic of this church where I work, St. Anne's, and there were some things up there in storage, uh, in particular these plaques that were given to different, um, uh, these, these, these cards that were used for recruitment of, of, of people into the religious life. There were uh, sisters who were playing on the guitar. The card showed them uh, sitting together and very happy. But there was one of these advertisements, one of these uh, promotional cards. It was completely gray, uh, just a simple, it had no design, no pictures of all, all the people, all the sisters or the, the brothers or the priests sitting together, uh, but rather just a very simple card trying to recruit people in the religious life. I don't remember exactly what it said, but it was something like this. Don't think that you're going to do something brand new or um, different with your life. But come to join us, and we'll help you to not waste your life. Again, don't, don't think that you're going to do something so unique or unusual with your life. But come to us, and you won't waste your life. If you're going to be able to say one day, my marriage... Uh, well, excuse me, um, ladies and gentlemen... Um, this reminds me of a time uh, I, I had an acquaintance, a doctor. And this doctor was taking care of me, and uh, I asked him a question. I said, you know, excuse me, doctor, uh, are these powders that you're giving to me, these medicines, are they going to help me? Are they going to be good? And he said to me in reply, um, Father, uh, I am not the best doctor that you're ever going to meet, but I'm very careful and I'm a, I'm a thoughtful doctor. And from that time, I try to tell myself that, you know, I'm not a, the most wonderful, spectacular priest, but I try to be a thoughtful priest. My marriage may not be as unique and as perfect as, for example, the Holy Family. But we try to be thoughtful to each other. We try to help each other. We try to correct each other when we do something wrong. So much depends on our expectations. Because most of us believe that marriage is like a fairy tale, like in the movies. It's kind of like during Christmas time when we watch these different uh, fairy tales and these different uh, um, legends on television. We see this uh, flying image of Santa with the reindeer or uh, the cartoons about Frosty the Snowman or things like this. And we think that this is real. We think that life is like a fairy tale. 
So we see our marriage like a fairy tale. So much depends on our expectations. I have a friend, a priest. When he was in the seminary, he wasn't very good with the philosophy courses. And so he was coming up to a very important exam in metaphysics. And he basically said to everyone that he's going to fail this exam. There's no way he could pass this exam. He called his parents, he called his mom, he said, Mom, I'm going to fail, I'm going to have to leave the seminary. And he actually believed this. Everybody in, in his circle thought he would fail. And then when he took the exam, and the grade came back, he had earned a C+. Plus. He called his mom. He was elated. He said, Mom, I got a C plus on the exam. And what did she say? She said to him, Son, I'm going to call the whole family. Let's make a big dinner to celebrate that you got a C plus. This is probably the first dinner in the whole world uh, for the for the purpose of celebrating a C plus. So you see, even if a marriage earns a grade of a C plus, it didn't fail. Remember that if your marriage has earned a C plus, you didn't fail. My beloved. You didn't fail. So why are these family issues so difficult? Because we don't understand, in truth, how big and how deep love can be. And we learn to love a little bit. And we say, we already know how to love. Uh, lots of examples of this. I love coffee. I love uh, a certain TV show. I, I love to read. But when we stand by the majesty of God, and I'm very sorry for this kind of a very personal example, I used to belong to the to the scouts. I wanted to be a, a boy scout. And our scout leader um, gave us an assignment, and the assignment was to design a house. Uh, it could be out of paper or cardboard, but the assignment was to design a house and bring it back to the next meeting. You could make a teepee or a wigwam or a mountain house, whatever you wanted with whatever kind of techniques you had. And I have many talents, but probably not very artistic talents, especially to working with clay or with, um, with art. And I remember like, uh, like today that I cut a house out of a, out of a, out of a cardboard uh, carton. I glued it. The whole house was like covered in glue, just like my hands and my clothes. And all of this barely held itself together. It was definitely crooked. It wasn't straight. But, you know, I thought it was great. I really was proud of my work. And I remember that I took this house when it dried and I put it into a bag 
a bag that I used to use for uh, carrying shoes. And I took it to the next meeting of the scouts, and I brought it there. And I saw the kinds of houses my friends had made, and I just was speechless. One was made out of matches, another was made out of wood. The, the leader said to me, Peter, take out your house so we can see it. And I said to him, uh, I forgot to bring it. And then I never returned to the scouts after that. And you see, we're going to come on the final judgment, on the final day, with our house. We're going to bring the house that we built, and we're going to have to show it. For example, maybe there's a parishioner here in the church who will say, I know how to love. Whenever I saw a dog on the street, I would feed it. I would pet it. And you know, um, it, it's been said that on the final judgment that really it's not so much that um, you're going to be told where to go. It's that people themselves choose. The people choose where they want to go. And that, for example, many people, when they pass to the next world, uh, they themselves know they have to go to purgatory. They have to be cleaned before they can enter this beautiful eternity. You can think of it like this, like when a woman is cleaning the house um, and preparing for, uh, uh, for guests uh, that may be coming the next day, and they come a day early. And there she is, she's not dressed, her hair is unkempt, she's wearing gloves, she's sweaty. So the doorbell rings and she opens it. Everybody's standing there in suits and smiles. And she says, come on in, come on in, but um, I'll, I'll uh, just be a minute, I have to go and watch up. And that's what purgatory is. Uh, we stand before God and we see how dirty we are and we say we have to go clean up before we can come back. So it's very possible that we ourselves will know when we're there where to go. And that our love is not the same league as God's. It's like it's like comparing it to my little cardboard house that was crooked and filled with glue uh, and comparing it to the houses of my, of my, of my scout mates. And that's why we, we have such difficult families. That's why we have such a difficult mother or such a difficult to deal with brother or a very difficult spouse so that we will learn true love. If you let me give you an example of what I'm trying to say, uh, not too long ago I received a letter from a young, um, from a young woman and it was right around Christmas, and I'm going to try to tell you this story so uh, so that no one would know who it is. And this was a letter from a, a woman, a young woman, whose father had, had died several years earlier. And she decided, uh, before Christmas, to write uh, a card to him. 
it, it wasn't alive anymore, but something, I guess, she needed to say. And this was the first time that she ever actually um, wrote down her thoughts to her father. I don't know if she didn't know him or, or if he died when she was little. But they were not, they were not close. And so she said she, um, she, she wrote this letter. Okay, so I, I interpreted this a little wrong. So let me let me go back. So she's a young woman, and she's not having a relationship with her father. Uh, they they haven't seen each other for many many years, and she decided for Christmas to send him a card, and she said she didn't really know why she decided to do it. Something inside her was telling her to do it. And when she was writing it, she was shaking. But um, she sent it, and she didn't even think she would ever get a response. And she doesn't really know why she was scared, but she came up with the idea that maybe she was just scared of, of being rejected again. And... A few days later, she checked her mailbox, and there was a card from her dad. And she couldn't believe the kind of kind words that were written in that card. Her dad wrote to her that he was uh, very, very joyful that she sent him this greeting for the holiday. And that... It meant so much to him, and that he hopes that their relationship could get better. And that I am his beloved daughter. And you know, Father, she said to me, I never thought that my dad would be able uh, or could even write such a thing. And how did I feel? I just started to cry. I just cried and cried. It was such a shock, such a surprise to me. Because, because I never thought I would receive such a present. Uh, I am very fearful, I am very afraid that I will disappoint or that something will not come out well. And now, if we look at this for a minute, we can say, wow, look how this ended up great. She wrote a card to her dad, he wrote her back. And now maybe they're going to be in each other's lives again, and things are going to move forward. And so, one could look at it that way, but then why is she doing all of this? And then she goes on to say that she goes on to say that I know that God will help me make this relationship better. Because, because God wants it to happen. And God wants me to see my dad the goodness in my dad. And that God wants me to know that I am loved, that I am a daughter who is loved. And that I have value. And that I am worth, I am worth this love because I'm a child of God. This isn't really about my dad. It's really about God. And if you are out there now listening and you're going to look for your dad but without God or you're going to look for your husband without God or you make your daughter 
in a higher place than God, or your child in a higher place than God, then you will never find this person. And one more example. Uh, a woman who was uh, cheated on by her husband, and this was this was published in the newspaper. And so this is no secret. And there was an interview with her in the newspaper. How did you feel when you first found out that your husband cheated on you? I was very emotional. First I was in shock. I didn't believe it. I thought this was just some kind of bad dream I'll wake up from. Then I was angry and I was crying and I had uh, much anger towards him. And then there was a phase where I felt that it was my fault and that I'm going to lose everything. I had no faith in myself. I felt that I was abandoned. And I was afraid that my whole world was ruined. I couldn't live normal anymore. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't, I could barely work. So the next question was, so what did you do? And she replied, well, the first thing, first thing I did to save my marriage uh, and my, my feelings of sadness to, to, to reverse them was to go on a pilgrimage to Częstochowa. And just for those of you not familiar, Częstochowa is a holy place in Poland where uh, there's a shrine to the Blessed Mother. And it's an important, uh, important reason, important holy place in Poland. And when I, when I got to Częstochowa, I told Mary everything that happened. Uh, I explained everything that happened to her, and I and I asked her to to save my marriage, to help save my marriage, to intercede, to help save my marriage. And I think it was because of Mary and her intercession that I was able to tell my husband, even though I was hurt, and even though it was so hard, that I that I loved him. And that despite what he's done, I'm going to continue to love him. This was very difficult. And I said to him that I know that he also still loves me and that our marriage and our love is a fight against evil, that evil is trying to break us. I felt that the devil um, tempted my husband, that the devil was attacking the marriage. So I started to fight with spiritual weapons. I used to, I started to pray very deeply. During the Holy Mass, I would pray for the conversion of my husband. I would pray the rosary every day. Every night while my husband was sleeping, I would put my hands on him. And I would pray that the Holy Spirit would come to him. And heal him. And to bring back the person who I remembered and who I love. I put him under the care of Saint Joseph. I begged Saint Joseph to intercede and to help save my marriage. During my conversations with um, God the Father, I would keep reminding him that the marriage was a sacrament, that we wanted to 
to do what was right. I, I reminded myself through these conversations that the sacrament of marriage is a guarantee that God will be with us. I said, God, you gave us to each other. You brought us together. Now give us healing. And how did my relationship look like with my husband? I loved him. And even though this is going to sound weird, I tried to treat him like I always did, not with any vengeance or anger. I started to ask him questions about how he was feeling about his work, about how uh, things that were important to him. I want you to understand I never accepted this romance that he had, but I didn't... Um, I didn't make him suffer and keep uh, bringing it up. I told him that he did something wrong, but that I believe in his love to me, and that I believe in his, in his heart and his goodness. I would remind him and re recall very beautiful times from our marriage. Our conversations would sometimes last hours. And not everything was uh, peaceful. We often uh, uh, hurt each other during these conversations. But Jesus changed me also. I was also changed. He wouldn't let my heart turn into a stone. He wouldn't let me seek vengeance or be too prideful. He didn't let me wallow in anger or... Um, uh, or hatred. I understood that I also had something to say I'm sorry for. That I'm not completely uh, innocent. Because in our past I also gave him many scars. And so what happened, she, the reporter asked, and the woman replied, our marriage survived. The love of Jesus in our sacramental marriage kept us together. We forgave each other. We became more mature, deeper and smarter. And to um, go on with this, my husband became religious again and started going with me to church. And he also understood the power of Jesus. That's what marriage is. That's what that's what marriage is about, to not give up on each other. Not to say, oh, you went? Oh, you went? Okay, well, you know, that's your choice. Now you got to live with it. Tomorrow you'll get a call from my attorney. But if we look at this woman who described her marriage, let us think about how much humility was born of this, how much humility she needed.
99% of women, when they hear that they've been cheated on, would say, get out. Don't touch me. Don't touch me, not even one finger. Get out. I never want to see you again. And think about at this moment, how can we come back to Jesus? It's very difficult. But this woman understood that marriage is to save each other. To save each other. Because all of us are under the attack of the evil one. Not everyone physically cheats on each other, but how many marriages cheat on each other in the mind, uh, in their thoughts. And even Jesus said that this is also a heavy sin to fantasize or to think about being with someone other than your sacramental spouse. It's very interesting to me how women, uh, mothers, uh, can really fight without any kind of uh, uh, tiredness for their sons. They can fight for their sons like angry tigers. But for the husband, they don't. I know uh, some women who have husbands who are alcoholics, who who years ago moved out. He, the husbands have escaped from the house. But this woman also has a son who's an alcoholic. And the mother will do everything for the son. She will have masses said. She will try to find him psychologist. She calls him, son, please stop drinking. Change, change. But when you ask her about the husband, she says, oh, who cares? Uh, he's just a drunk. And doesn't have the same... Uh, a desire to fight for the husband. And my question is, why? Why? Why is she trying to save the son? Uh, she's going to be 80 years old, and she's going, she's going to try to save the son, but the husband, she's not even going to bother. She should really try to save the husband as well as the son, not to give up on the husband. Uh, a very famous marriage psychologist named Dr. Jacek Palikowski said that um, women should be teachers of love. That they're very patient, just like they're very patient for children. Dear son, that's not how you put the spoon back. Uh, dear daughter, that's not how you do this. Dear son, uh, this is what you do. But to the husband, she says, if you do that one more time, you'll see, you'll see. If you put the spoon like that one more time, it's the end. But the husband in the family, he is for uh, responsibility. Because you see, wife, we're going to go on vacation and you are going to get there safely and we're going to have a safe apartment and I'm going to protect you from anything we encounter on the way. And when we get there, uh, there's going to need to be flowers put on the table, but that's your job. And with the very little kids, you're going to speak to them mostly. I'm going to be there, but you're going to teach them uh, at a very young age. And you see, my dear brothers and sisters, all of this is able to be dealt with with humility. 
że w przysiędze ślubnej nie jest powiedziane Please realize that during the marriage vows it is not said that I am taking you, for example, Eva, but instead the vows are, I am taking you as my wife. I'm not taking you, I'm taking you as my wife. I can't just take somebody and start to, um, you know, force them to do what I want them to do. Not, uh, I'm taking you, for example, Christopher, but I'm taking you for my husband, and I have you now as my husband. You are the husband. And your job is to protect me. That's what God has given you a predisposition for, to protect me. At the, as we get to the end of this homily, I'd like to remind us of today's reading. And I'm getting to this uh, at the end of the homily, but uh, it's important to know that the Gospel uh, frequently The, 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 the Bible, the Gospel, is like an important brochure. It's the most uh, carefully written uh, book in the world. Every letter, every word was inspired and thought of um, by the Holy Spirit. If in the Gospel, therefore, like for example the reading we had today, we see a, a word repeated multiple times, then that's an important word. And in fact, the word didn't have to be there in the first place. Uh, the language could have been something else. And so when a word is repeated many times, and particularly in a reading, it means that the word is important. Because, of course, you could tell the same information using a different word. What's, and what's the word that I have on my mind here? Well, listen, uh, the angel of the Lord... Uh, and the word here is, is asleep, that the angel is speaking to Joseph while he's asleep. Why while he's asleep? Because when you're asleep, you're very vulnerable, right? You're vulnerable and you're attentive in, in terms of uh, many people remember their dreams if they're very important dreams. And you see, it's important that this happened in a dream because men automatically want to do something. They want to, they want to respond. They want to respond with action. What am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? Concrete response. Men don't like to just sit when they're called to action. They want to do something. And this is why God talked to Joseph when he was sleeping so that he wouldn't have an, on, an automatic uh, response to, to action. And the other thing is that dreams are connected with your deep heart, are connected with your heart. My dear brothers and sisters, we know that feeling. I had a bad dream. I had a dream about my mom. I had a dream about my neighbor. An accident or somebody was robbed. When we wake up, 
we're sweating, but then we're thankful that it was just a dream. And so a dream can have the ability to penetrate our heart and wake us up. And usually we wake up and say, oh, thank goodness that was just a dream. But we still feel fearful. And not once somebody says, a few days ago I had a bad dream and I'm walking around thinking about it all the time. Because dreams touch our deep heart. Dreams touch who you are. Your I. The, the letter I. You know, like I am. They touch who you are. I myself remember some of my dreams from when I was a child over 30, 40 years ago. When, when I would awake either completely sweaty or completely excited. And so God wants to talk to Joseph and put something deep into his heart. So what does he say? Get up, take the child and Mary and go to Egypt. And so what did he do? He got up in the middle of the night, he took the baby, and he took Mary, and he went to Egypt. And another time, when King Herod died, the angel of the Lord came to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the baby and his mother, and go back to Israel. And that's what Joseph did, because God wanted to code this message deep into Joseph's heart. And so, uh, an important word in this gospel is, get up, stein, in Polish, get up, stand. Why? Why, why is this word here? This could have, some other word could have been used. For example, St. Joseph, take the child and his mother and go to Egypt. Of course, it makes uh, logical sense that you have to stand and go anyway. So why say the word get up or stand? And Matthew uses the word stein or stand, get up. And the reason why is that you can't do nothing unless you stand. Right? You can't do anything unless you stand. And we like to lay down. Us men, we like to lay. This is a spiritual problem. Men are cut down. We're bogged down with sex, with erotica. A warrior, on the other hand, doesn't lay down. A warrior stands. When you see two men fighting, they're not laying down. They're, they're standing. Men today lay. They lay from being hurt, from being hurt physically, from being hurt mentally. Here the the injuries can be alcoholism or loneliness, or they or they lay in the bed of a prostitute at a uh, at an escort service. They're laying. They're not standing. They're laying on the couch in front of the television. They're laying, but they have to stand. This doesn't. This doesn't always mean to stand, uh, physically stand, but to stand in, in the spirit. Satan will tell you that you're um, hopeless, that you're zero, that you're not worthy of anything. Oh, look at your friends, how, kind, how they have these great careers. 
Look at your friends, how they have these great houses. And what do you have? You're nothing. Satan will tell you, hey, go on the internet tonight. Look at those women again. Oh, you can have all your choice of whoever you want. Just click those buttons. Satan will say to you, flirt with your co-worker. What harm can it do? Do you see what kind of knight you are? You are meant to fight, to stand and fight. Stand up straight, men. Go to confession if you've fallen. Confess those sins. Tell your wife like this, Yes, I made a mistake. But I went to confession. I'm working on this. And don't put me down for the for the one hundredth time here. Because I have stood up straight. Pay attention. This doesn't mean like today we're talking about Saint Joseph being in an important role. This doesn't mean we're supposed to be like a cyborg and just respond to commands. You see, even Joseph, when he was told to go back to Israel, when he heard that Archelaus was uh, had taken the place of Herod, uh, he decided to not go back. Uh, uh, to Bethlehem, but to go uh, to Galilee and to settle in Nazareth. So, um, what does this mean? This means that that Joseph listened, but Joseph also had uh, a sense, uh, an instinct, uh, a good instinct that was uh, that was uh, there because of his prayerful nature and his willingness to serve God. And so, what does the Bible tell us here? It says that St. Joseph was afraid. Right? The Bible says St. Joseph was afraid to go back to the area where Herod was, now, now ruled by Archelaus. And so he went to another place in Israel, and God understood the fear. God worked with Joseph. So God agreed to it when Joseph decided to go in the other direction from Bethlehem and settle uh, in Nazareth. So it, it's okay to have fear. Uh, my brothers and sisters, I also have fear. And so when I fall, I go to confession, I ask God for forgiveness, and I stand up again, and I keep going. Satan would only uh, dream of uh, ruining a priest, uh, because when he ruins a priest, he takes so many others with him. Um, so as a priest, uh, I have to work even harder. You have to stand. You have to stand. If you're having problems, go talk to a priest. Go, go do a confession of your whole life. Uh, come to Jesus. We're very intelligent as men. There's uh, many things we can do. Uh, we are very easy to pick up skills. But something's not right. We don't walk straight. We walk with our head down. It should not be like this. We don't feel confident. So, when I say to 
my uh, parishioners who come to talk about their husbands, I say, give them a book about um, masculinity, about how to respond to stress as a man. Uh, and and when I go and I and I want to give this book to my husband, they say never. Uh, they have a hundred reasons for why they shouldn't read this book. Because we're scared to read these books. We're scared of uh, certain conversations. But you have to take the bull by its horns. The most dangerous man is the man who has stopped being afraid. The most dangerous man is the man who stopped being afraid. It is the most dangerous soldier. As long as he's afraid, he, he has uh, limited potential. Remember what the gladiators said to his to his peers, we're going to fight. If you see during the time of your fighting that you're in a garden that's filled with green colors, don't worry. It's a little side issue. It just means that you've died and entered paradise. The gladiators say. Don't worry as a man that someone's going to laugh at you because we men, we, we worry that someone might laugh at us. Oh, they might laugh that you're religious or that you like to read the Bible or go to church. It's better to talk about politics or about cars or sports. I know that those of you in church today, that you're not ashamed. But how many men out there are? This is our assignment to stand and to take your wife, take our wives, into our world. Even when we see in the, in the, in the Gospel today, it says to Joseph to take Mary and the child, take her. And so uh, this is a very strong text, to take her, take your wife into your world. Into the world of safety, into the world of sacrifice. And dear women, uh, oftentimes this day uh, that we celebrate today in the church, the Feast of the Holy Family, is difficult for many women. That, that uh, maybe it's time for the church to stop reading this letter of St. Paul to the Colossians that says, uh, Women be subservient to your husbands. Not today, not in the 21st century. What is this? But you see, this text is to be subservient to a man, the kind of man who would give up his life for you. All right? The kind of man that loves you with a deep love and who you can trust that will provide for your safety. And then you give yourself to him. And he is there in a way that he would, he would give up his life for you. Imagine, and you know, this hopefully will never happen, but imagine that the war breaks out. We're in Warsaw, and a soldier comes up to you, and he says, please get into the car. And the woman's going to say, what, are you going to try to boss me around? 
I'll go if I want to. But if there was a war, you would listen to the officers because you would know that they want to bring you to safety. And not only would you listen, but you would you would ask questions. Should I go here? Should I go there? What should I do? And there is a war, in fact. And a husband is supposed to love his wife just like Jesus loved people. Uh, to wash her feet and to die on the cross for her. And for this kind of man, a woman should be subservient. A strong, a smart, a tough man. And my dear brothers, sometimes before you have conversation with a woman, you need to go to confession, to get clean, to get spiritually clean, so that you will have strength. You have strength and righteousness, so that when you speak, you will command respect. Do you know why we fight all the time in our marriage? Because the woman often feels that she's not being told the whole truth. And there are hundreds of these conversations and they, they don't go anywhere. They lead to Siberia. They have no, um, they bring no fruits. But when a, a person has strength and power, inside uh, a, a pure and a clear strength you could say just one word and it will have an effect when it's time for a very important family conversation in fact it would be good for both partners to go to confession for the husband and the wife prior to this difficult conversation because it brings clarity, purity, and wisdom. Stand. Stand and try to bring your wife into your world. And you're going to be able to walk past Satan, who's going to be trying to attack you the whole time. You have to just stand. Joseph stood up in the middle of the night and took care of his family. And by the way, we're not always going to be perfect. We are going to make mistakes and we have the right to make mistakes. As long as we learn from them. As long as we learn from the, from the actions that led to us getting hit on the head by the consequences. We have to try to do experiments to figure out what's best. And in our young age, we may experiment and maybe we cross the line sometimes. But you have to come back. God understands the desire to do the experiment, but you have to come back. God didn't yell at Joseph and say, Oh, you know what? You're scared. What are you kidding me? He didn't, he didn't scream at Joseph. God understood that Joseph had a right to be scared. You have the right to be scared, but you have to try to bring the Spirit of Jesus into your marriage. My dear brothers and sisters, one more time I will repeat. Let's not wait for the fireworks. Let's not wait for the perfect Hollywood family, movie family. 
let's put Jesus into the center of our family. But let's put Jesus in the first place. And when you put Jesus in the first place, everything else is in the right place. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for this homily by Father Pavlukevich. Thank you for the wisdom that he was able to explain to us about family, about what it means to be a husband, what it means to be a wife, about the power of forgiveness, about the ability to, to, to be afraid but to trust in Jesus. Let us not give up on our marriages so easily. Of course, there are, are going to be situations where there is an impasse that just is. But try. let us try to explore every possibility for salvage and forgiveness. Because this person who we once loved so much and so intensely is meant for us. And God has given this person to us so that we can maneuver through the polygon together and help each other. And so I ask God to bless you and to bless your marriage and to help you find a way to forgive and to love. And like a, somewhere I read in a book, I can't remember where, love anyway, just love anyway. Loving anyway will be the solution. God bless you.